Hello everyone, today we're going to do another fan requested video. And again, I just want to thank all of you subscribers and people who share, like, follow, interact and comment and tell me what you want to see because that makes me feel better about, about just talking to the black box that is my camera phone. But anyway, so today we're going to talk about five good pet tree frogs. We've already talked about amphibians in a couple different videos, five beginner amphibians and all of that. But today we someone specifically requested tree frogs. So I'm going to talk about five good choices of pet tree frogs. They're obviously not the only ones, and there are dozens of species of tree frogs that can make very good pets. I'm just going to pick five that I think are good for kind of anybody to get. So I'm going to start with the, we're going to go from probably the most delicate, most expensive, or least great beginner, and we're going to move down and just what is really just kind of my opinion about it. It's not necessarily fact, but just go down. So none of these really require UVB, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't offer it. Um, I think that you should always offer UVB if you can, specifically with amphibians and really every lizard, and even snakes too if you can, if you want. Um, all frogs are essentially nocturnal. There are some that will be not sleeping or a little bit more active during your day, but they are most active at dusk and at night, and that's when you're going to hear them calling and chirping and all that fun jazz. So we're going to start with that assumption and then just get right down in the list. So at number five out of the five and going down again, that's the red-eyed tree frog. Arguably the most iconic just frog period in the pet hobby or whatever it may be. And that's for obvious reasons. When they are awake, they are stunningly beautiful little animals. Those obviously for their namesake, giant bright red eyes with that perfect green skin, the hilarious little f legs and hands, and that really just um, really striking blue pattern on the sides. There's not a whole lot of blue or natural blue in the animal kingdom, and they have it, which looks really cool. But the reason why they're number five on the list instead of further down the road is for a couple different reasons. Is Number one, they are kind of the most delicate. Amphibians in general can be pretty hardy, but they really don't withstand a lot of temperatures a lot of uh, dry climate and a lot of handling. And the red-eyed tree frogs on this list are definitely the most delicate when it comes to that. So with that in mind, you do need to remember, and with all of these on the list, they do need a lot of humidity because they're frogs. They have that porous skin that absorbs moisture from the water as well as in the air too. And they don't like handling, period. There are a couple that are a little bit more tolerant and we'll get down to them, but I still wouldn't really recommend handling amphibians more often than you ever really have to. But these guys are really cool. The only problem with these is that you probably won't see them a whole lot unless you kind of like camp out or pop, on, pop in and turn on the lights really quick at night and then you'll actually see them up and about. Otherwise, during the day, almost entirely, they will be sleeping. They'll be under, they'll be up against the side of their enclosure. They'll be under leaves, behind logs, under rock, not really under rocks because they're very arboreal. Um, you'll almost never see them on the ground, but you will they'll be asleep during the day and at night you'll be able to see them. They do call a little bit, but you don't really hear it very much at all unless you have like big groups of them in places for them to spawn in. But if you're just keeping a couple in like a little exoterra, up, exoterra upright 12 by 12, which is a good enclosure for like a couple, like two or three, which is a good starter minimum enclosure, you're really not going to hear them calling a lot. But that being said, they are... They are interesting, too, to look at during the day because uh, red-eyed tree frogs and a couple other frogs have this really cool kind of like third membrane that covers their eye. So obviously they do have eyelids and they can completely shut their eyes, unlike snakes, but like a lot of amphibians and lizards, they can completely shut their eyes. But they have this third membrane that covers it that kind of like with sharks when they have that membrane when they bite down on stuff that protects their eye, they have one that's kind of opaque, like this cool little opaque lattice that covers it that allows them to not see shapes and color very well but really picks up shadow and light so that when when they are sleeping that they can still see that shadow and light disturbance of a predator's coming along and picking them up so red-eyed tree frogs they can make a decent beginning pet tree frog i've had a couple in the past but they were already mature older adults when i got them and some other ones that are very similar are um, there's black eyed tree frogs, which are similar. There's white lit tree frogs and there's tiger leg tree frogs. Um, the tiger legs are a little bit smaller, but they're probably the closest in care and overall kind of like personality of the red eyed tree frogs. 
So moving on down the road is the green tree frog. These guys are very, very common. They're endemic to the United States, mostly in the southwest, uh, south and southeast, so Florida up kind of the, the east coast. Um, very, They're fairly hardy when it comes to amphibians. Again, when we think of hardy, we think of like a bearded dragon or like a snake or like a like a corn snake or something but as far as amphibians go most of these are pretty hardy and green tree frogs definitely are and that's probably because they do come from north america and while florida is still you know quite tropical it's a little bit more weather depend like the weather is fluctuates there we go fluctuates <laughs> is a little bit more than like say some places in southeast asia or africa where they're directly on the the equator where you don't really get a whole lot of temperature fluctuations you just mostly have a wet and a dry season but they don't get very large only two to two and a half inches for like a big female they do commune pretty well so you can cohabitate if you give them a big enough enclosure and lots of places for them to hide amphibians as a whole are quite cannibalistic but if they're all relatively the same size, you give them lots of food, lots of places to hide. And, you know, if they require a basking spot or whatever, give them a couple on both ends to kind of give them a little bit. If you're going to give them a large, large enclosure, then I think you'll be okay. Um, these guys, the, specifically the males, because the males are the ones that call, are very vocal. They have a cool little chirping croak call. Um, and it's with all these as well. Make sure you give them a nice clean water dish that has been uh, purified or um sits out for at least 24 hours to kind of help with that because just tap water will kill amphibians but they're really cool they're all insectivores feed them dusted crickets mealworms maybe not small roaches because they always have even the small ones have really hard shells um silkworms black fly larva things like that works really well but they're really cool they don't really handle a whole lot but they are cool they do make interesting little amphibians to take care of especially if it's like your ch like a kid's first pet then that's a really good choice to go with and with that in mind we'll move right along to the next one and personally my favorite frog the amazon milk frog we've done a video about them and you if you want to you can take a look right here and check them out and i know this is anthropomorphizing them a little bit but they just look like such ch judgy chubby little chonkers they're, they're really cool. They're one of the ones that are actually more active or at least don't hide during the day. They'll just hang out kind of whoop, constantly, and that's really cool. They're one of the larger tree frog species, you know, with the exception of, like, the monkey frogs, like the waxies or the Mexican monkey frogs that just get huge. But they get some decent size to them. They're, like I said, they're heckin' chonker frogs. And they call them milk frogs for pretty obvious reasons which is, you know, when they feel threatened, they will secrete this foul-tasting, semi-toxic substance from their skin, which if it gets in a predator's mouth or eyes, it's not great. So they're really cool. Um, they don't, all of them, they, they need to stay fairly, like, room temp, coolish. Like, anything above 83, 84 is very dangerous to most amphibians and most frogs. But, you know, if it's got really cold, you can give them a little hot spot. Once again, just make sure you keep them nice and moist. Feeding, feeding the various diets of dusted and calcium, uh, dust, calcium dust and multivitamin dust. Ugh, that's not good. I'm already flubbing already. I'm so sorry, you guys. But they're really cool. They are one of the more expensive ones. You usually find them for, like, small little ones. I've seen them a lot for, like, $75 to $90, whereas, like, the green tree frogs you can usually find for, like, 4 or $5. So if you that in mind, but... They do get bigger, their lifespans are a little bit longer, and honestly, I think they're cuter. And they do call too. Mine refuse to, which means they're either both females, because I don't know how to, uh, I don't know how to sex them very well, or really at all. They could both be girls, or just they don't like to in general, but they do call, and they can get pretty loud. So if you can get a male or a couple males, and then you hear them calling, that'll be really interesting and be really cool to hear, because I've heard recordings of them, and I really wish mine did. But with that being said, Moving down the one, this one is not as iconic as the red-eyed tree frog, but I feel like they're one of the most popular tree frogs, and that is the whites or Australian or chubby tree frog. They all have the same name. They all come from a couple different localities and subspecies, but all from Australia and uh, Indonesia, so that indo Aussie, New Guinea area. So they're really, really cool because they're one of the larger ones. They call them chubby for a reason, 
and these guys are one of the more hardy ones. So again, handling not the best, I wouldn't recommend it more than necessary, but they will tolerate it and hold up a little bit better than really any of the other ones on the list. And they're very hardy. They can take the dry and the uh, the dry and the humid fluctuations a little bit better than some of the other ones. Still try to keep that humidity of at least 60 to 80% kind of constantly, but they can take it a little bit better as, you know, there's a learning curve, unfortunately. But that's with everything in life, and that's how it is. And so, not necessarily a training wheels pet, but one that you're going to start off with and you want to continue on, an Australian or chubby tree frog is really cool. The White's tree frogs, and I'm just going to use all of these names anyway, are really cool because they kind of come in a variety of colors now that we've started to specifically line breed them, line breed them or breed for different things. So usually when you see them, they're a pretty good green color, but they come in all sorts of colors now, blues and purples. I think there's albinos and hypos. There's a whole bunch of different colors out there. So you kind of have from the entry level, just white's tree frog, normal looking one, to if you really get into the species and you really like taking care of it, you can have a purple tree frog, which would be really, really cool. Not necessarily as bright as like the poison dart frogs, but that's okay. They're still really, really cool tree frogs. And I don't, I've never kept them, but one day I think I'd like to just have like a little colony of them in like a big upright 40 gallon aquarium or something like that. Um, but moving right along. And then the last one on this list, in all honesty, I personally would choose the whites or the Amazon tree frog over this one. But these guys do make very hardy, good first time tree frog pets. And that is the Cuban tree frog. So the Cuban tree frog is interesting because they're not actually endemic to North America, or at least continental North America, but they're one of the most common tree frogs, and that's because they are heavily invasive because they hitch a ride on so many imported plants and produce that they just kind of pop up everywhere. So and they're very prolific. And a lot of times people confuse them for brown, not brown, but for uh, young green tree frogs because when green tree frogs are born they're not bright bright green they're kind of like a brownish color and then they'll slowly turn to that nice green color but Cuban tree frogs they actually have the ability to change color just kind of how they're feeling in their environment like a lot of other animals and a lot of snakes as it turns out which I am learning that more and more do that but they can go from almost a white color to a milky brown to a dark brown and then sometimes even to a dark green and so whenever, you know, you bring in a plant and you flip it up and there's a couple frogs sitting there, you might have a couple green tree frogs or you might end up with a green tree frog and then a baby Cuban frog that will very quickly outsize and unfortunately, if you decided to house them together, eat the green tree frog because Cuban tree frogs get big. They, a big female can get over six inches from head to butt, I guess. Um, there's an actual anatomical definition for or term for that, but from head to butt, they are one of the larger American tree frogs, which is really cool. They're very hardy. They can stand to a lot of different temperature and humidity fluctuations, although not necessarily the best for them, but they are certainly very hardy. Um, they can withstand a little bit more handling, maybe not necessarily as much as the whites, but they can do pretty well. But once again, and I know I keep coming back to this, but I really do recommend not handling amphibians more than necessary. It can damage their skin, the oils in your hands. Like, if you've ever seen me mess with them, I'm usually wearing gloves for a reason, just because it can be so damaging to them. But hopefully you enjoyed this video. I don't know nearly as much about amphibians as I would like to, and especially not as much as I just do with snakes, because that's definitely, you know, that's my jam are the snakes, but that doesn't mean I don't love them. I have several frog species here including we have a tiger lake frog and we have the tomato frogs and African ch or uh, Asian chubby frogs and we have the Amazon milk frogs my personal favorite so and hopefully I'm planning to get a few more down the road too of some other fun little species that I would love to be able to share with you guys but hopefully I gave you a little bit of info that you didn't know yet or gave you some ideas if you're thinking about getting some of these specific tree frogs versus like one of the ground frogs like the tomatoes or a pac-man or something like that but if you're looking for tree frogs i think these are some good ideas to get you into that before you kind of start to branch out and go crazy as we all tend to do but once again hope you enjoyed the video if you have any suggestions for future videos please let me know down in the comments check out my facebook and instagram i'm 
just awful at posting an Instagram these days, but I'm going to do my best to do better about that. For more regular updates, check out the podcast, Keep Calm, It's Just a Snake Podcast. It's not just about snakes, but once again, that's my lane. That's where I end up coming across with more people, but hopefully I will expand out. We've already had a few different people on there as well, as already as well, and we can get expand to maybe some mammalian people, to some crocodilian people, all sorts of fun stuff. So check that out, and if you want to, go check out the Patreon for Jay-Z Reptiles as well. There's a couple different uh, patron levels that includes free gifts like t-shirts, the really cool little wristbands of Keep Calm, It's Just a Snake podcast wristbands, stickers, as well as, you know, it does help here. So we're going to use any of the money that comes in from Patreon to directly benefit the animals. So either that being new, enc new, new enclosures, new lighting, moving forward with like an educational program, marketing for things like that. That's what the Patreon's going to go to is something to directly benefit the animals that we have and spreading the knowledge and passion we have for them to everyone else. So thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed the video and we'll check you next time.